Time now to let it rip, and because COVID cases are once again on the rise in Metro Detroit, we are back on Zoom, at least for now. And via Zoom tonight, we're joined by Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Madam Secretary, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Always great to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about news of the week. Uh, first off, $100 million, a tall order that uh, you put forth just the other day, talking about the needs for Michigan elections. Where would that money go, and why is that price tag so high? Well, the $100 million figure, which really is what it costs to ensure we've got safe, secure elections here in Michigan, it's based on the pre-pandemic cost of the March 2020 election and then extrapolated to take into account the general election higher costs and the fact that we'll have two and that there's no more election-related COVID funding or other funding from non-governmental sources this year. The, the majority of funding sources that we've utilized in recent elections have been one one time or extremely specific allocations of funding, like uh, from the federal government. So we don't actually have uh, funds from those past sources remaining. And really our priority is, is not simply funding, uh, but sustained reliable funding. Those grants uh, that we've received in the past from the federal government run out and expire. And uh, we always are in this position of trying to find ways uh, on a shoestring to run democracy. So we're trying to partner with the legislature to make sure this is sustained funding and recognizes the increasing costs of elections, even in, a, in an era, uh, the sort of the, the, the waning eras of the pandemic, but still one in which we have to keep the health and, and safety of our poll workers and voters paramount. All right, let's take a look back here, Secretary Benson, to 2020 for a moment. Uh, everybody, of course, got those uh, absentee ballot applications in the mail. Then came in the criticism from many people on the other side of the political spectrum on the right who said, what are we doing here? Now we understand that your office is saying, look, uh, we won't mail absentee ballot applications uh, this time around. Why that decision? Well, first, what we were doing, and to answer that question in 2020, was educating voters about their right to vote from home. That was the first major election cycle in which they had that right, that was that they themselves voted into our state constitution, uh, amending it in 2018, overwhelmingly, uh, to ensure they had the right to vote absentee. So what we did was what the data showed and what secretaries of state in various other states, Democrats and Republicans were doing to educate voters that they had an option to vote safely from home, which was particularly important in the midst of a pandemic. So that decision to basically send request forms for anyone who wanted to request an absentee ballot be mailed to them, uh, sending that to every registered voter in 2020, which by yeah. the way, the courts affirmed was well within my right to do, uh, that was really in consideration of the pandemic and wanting to ensure at the height of the pandemic and its spread in Michigan that voters understood the full spectrum of their voting options, including a safe and secure way to vote from home. And then secondly, again, this was the first major election cycle in 2020 where they had that right. And while our voter education efforts will continue this year, we are leaving the decision about sending request forms specifically to our local clerks. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it make more sense, would you say, to, to just continue to do that this time around, making sure that everybody has what they need in the mail uh, on time and, and, and to get out there and vote? Yes, we suspect also that a lot of nonprofit organizations uh, will be sending request forms. They're more widely available than they were in 2020. And again, I, I expect and I'm encouraging local clerks to do this as well. The data shows when the request form for an absentee ballot comes from either a secretary of state or a local clerk, it has uh, it means the most uh, and carries the most weight with, with registered voters. So again, I think local clerks will be sending them out and we're encouraging them and supporting them when they do that. Uh, but for, you know, all these reasons, we felt it wasn't necessary for us to do it at the state level, given uh, the, the, the current state of events and and, uh, and and the needs of the electorate. More people voted from home, by the way, in 2020 than ever before, 3.3 million. So we also are in the scenario of a lot of people have recently voted from home. They know how to get the materials. Uh, and we're you know confident that the online application, uh, which is available to everyone at michigan.gov slash elections, uh, will also be readily available for any citizen wanting to ensure they get that ballot sent to them. Secretary Benson, uh, with all due respect, you also, of course, run for office and, and, and this is a political year. Uh, could this be because partially because of the criticism that you got? It was such a heavy onslaught of criticism about having done that. Is that one of the reasons? 
No, because the 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 response wasn't rooted in in anything real. Uh, it was really a political uh, effort to you know that we saw not just happen in Michigan but all around the country uh, to delegitimize voting from home or voting absentee, which was particularly pernicious to to see in the midst of a, this pandemic. So no, it, it, nor should it have anything to do with the noise, the political noise, and the partisan rhetoric of any particular moment. Our decisions are always data driven, and in this case, it's an assessment as to whether or not. Uh, we, at this point in time in May, uh, see a need for it in the same way we did in 2020 and the same factors that led us to do it in 2020 aren't, aren't there in the same way. Let's talk about what we can bring uh, in order to go register to vote. Uh, the group Secure Michigan Vote says, hey, why not when you register, uh, be able to bring your, not be able to, but rather have to have your ID and the last four of your social security number. Uh, why is that an issue? Why isn't that something that we should be encouraging people in order to make sure that no one does question the legitimacy of an election? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to note we do have secure protocols in place that are time tested and proven to ensure that only only registered and valid voters votes count. Uh, and so those security protocols, whether they're multiple signature checks uh, or other types of ways in which uh, ballots are validated uh, have, have worked. And adding additional things like it requiring voters to put your social security number on the outside of an envelope opens, uh, opens voters up to potential identity theft, uh, which particularly for our senior citizens uh, has, has been an issue that, that concerns me and, and that I think should concern lawmakers as well. We want to maintain the security of our elections while, while also not asking our voters to risk their own security or uh, you know, open themselves up to identity theft. And so that's one of the reasons why proposals like that simply aren't workable. Uh, but again, they're a solution in search of a problem, given the fact that despite the, the rhetoric, conspiracy theories, and misinformation, that hasn't changed the reality that our, our elections actually are secure. We do identify every voter before their ballots are counted, whether it's through their signature or photo ID. And those are provisions that have always worked in our state and have continued to work in ours and other states. And, and we're going to just continue to, to operate under that as opposed to, again, responding to lies and myths out there that have been proven again and again to be false. But when you take a look at the process when it comes to Social Security, the last four of the Social Security, when you go to the Secretary of State website, it does ask you for the last four of your Social Security as well. How is this different? It's different than putting it on the outside of an envelope and sending it through the mail where various people could see it at, at various different times. That is what the, the proposals would require and would actually, as again, has been has been seen play out in the potential for identity theft. And it's something that we shouldn't ask our voters to do in order for them to, to, to open themselves up to that in order to access what is a right of theirs under our state constitution, their option to vote absentee. Secretary Benson, uh, you've addressed this next one quite a bit, of course, in the last uh, couple of years. But when we talk about uh, people who are dead still being on the rolls, uh, I know that there was a big cleanup effort to get rid of, obviously, so many of those names. But still, there remains uh, some people on those rolls. Uh, why is that so hard to clean up? Well, there's actually, again, a lot of misinformation about that, too. We have been working, as you know, uh, through many different ways, uh, through joining an interstate consortium to share data, to work with the federal government to make sure when uh, there are death records that we get them and can update our voter rolls accordingly. Uh, and there's there's really no, uh, there, there are allegations, but they haven't been backed up with actual evidence of, of, of people who are uh, deceased on our rolls. And then, of course, you know, um, somehow getting through the system and, and someone impersonating, that, impersonating them and voting. If that happens and there's no evidence that it does, uh, we would catch it and we would prosecute it accordingly. So we have, again, this is another scenario where we've got protections in place. Our voter list based on a number of things and steps we've taken over the last several years is actually more accurate and up to date than ever before. And uh, people can go to michigan.gov slash elections and click on a, a link that actually details all the work that we've done to increase the accuracy of our lists. Partisan groups are, you know, will we'll continue to make allegations uh, with without actually, you know, rooted in truth, and we'll continue to respond to those allegations wherever they may be with the data uh, and with the confidence that our roles our roles are accurate and those who actually vote are registered eligible voters who are eligible to do so. Secretary Benson, our final question: uh, You obviously are the Secretary of State for all of Michigan. That means Republicans and Democrats. For those out there who are Republicans. Uh, who still have some doubts and questions about the election in 2020, 
Um, we have a lot of names that are thrown out there and people put them into one category and say the insurrectionists mm. are, are, you know, and they say everyone who doubts anything and is, is like an insurrectionist. Do you think we all can get better about using names and nomikers to put people in boxes? And that means people on the left and the right. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think we have to recognize first, a lot of people have been misled by people they trust, which you and I've talked about before. And that's really sad to see. And, and you know, I think we need more leaders uh, to uh, particularly those who are spreading misinformation uh, to um, you know um, be mindful of their responsibility to tell the truth. That said, in the same way, I think you know labels in general uh, and putting people or painting people with broad, broad brushes when many things are nuanced uh, is doesn't really do anyone. It doesn't really advance the issue. Or, or, or solve problems, which has been really what I've tried to do throughout my tenure. Uh, and I'm, I try to be as mindful as I can about being truthful when someone does deny the results of the 2020 election, despite all the evidence showing that they're accurate. Calling that person a, a, an election denier is something that has been an accurate uh, statement. But there are other ways in which, or you know, again, if someone is 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 a participant, a proven participant in the January sixth insurrection, and then then perhaps saying an insurrectionist is accurate. So there are times when 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 terminology can be accurate, but there's other times where it can be hyperbolic. And I think it's important for us to delineate in those nuances. And I certainly try to do that, and and hope that others do as well. Well, Secretary Benson, you are a busy person. We thank you so much for your time today. I know it's going to get even more busy uh, this August and, of course, November as we uh, kind of full, full steam forward, move ahead here. But we thank you for joining us here tonight on Let It Rip. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Rup. Good to see you. Too. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Let It Rip on the panel tonight. He's been a political consultant and activist, a federal prison inmate, and now a candidate for Congress. Sam Riddle is running in the Democratic Party in the 13th Congressional District in that primary, and we're honored to have him with us tonight. And there's also Karen Dumas, former Detroit City Hall insider and current PR guru, who also co-hosts the No BS News Hour Plus, making his Let It Rip debut tonight. Another candidate in the 13th Congressional District with one big difference. Martel Bivings is running in that race as a Republican. And because he's the only candidate to get enough signatures to qualify for the primary, he is right now the party's default nominee in November. We thank all of you for joining us today on Let It Rip. Want to mention one quick thing. You saw that interview with Secretary of State Benson. That was shot on Wednesday night. That was the only availability we had with her. But as you'll notice, of course, there was no mention of the big news that was broken today, just hours ago, in which Secretary of State Benson tells NBC News on the network level that she heard from somebody in the Trump White House who was present at a meeting that the former president 18 months ago had indicated that he wanted Secretary of State Benson tried for treason, arrested and executed. This coming 18 months after that alleged comment was made inside of a White House meeting. And so, Karen, we'll begin with you. Uh, you know, you're a PR guru out there. 18 months after the fact, we're hearing this on the network after we had a conversation with her yesterday. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's a disappointing route, first of all. Why is it 18 months that we're just hearing from this? She had an interview with you. Why didn't she disclose it? And then thereafter, why isn't she willing to share her sources? She's not a journalist. She's a public official. Um, it almost kind of feels like she's trying to take a page from uh, Governor Whitmer's playbook uh, in terms of you know garnering sympathy. This is an election year. And so I think that this is a unfortunate uh, and, and a failed attempt to just try to, you know, bring some attention to what it is that she's trying to do in her campaign. But I just, it, it's it's very poor handling of uh, what probably isn't a very true statement. And we want to mention that we reached out to the Secretary of State's office, talked with a spokesperson and asked her specifically why those comments are now just coming to light 18 months later. We also uh, asked who was the source. And at this point, we haven't heard the answers to those questions. And so, Sam Riddle, when you hear this happen during an election year, you've been around the block a few times. What are your thoughts? Well, I've had the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Linson, in the studio on my show on 910 Superstation, Riddle at Random. And I can tell you, Karen Dumas is definitely in the right ballpark. Clearly, this elect is electioneering on the part of the Secretary of State. And Secretary of State, I love you, but don't play us. We're not playable. Trump is capable of anything at any time. And nothing you say can shock us about Trump. Relax. Run your campaign, Secretary of State Benson. 
Martel, you're a Republican. When you hear stories like that, that are allegations coming from the old White House, the Trump White House, uh, what goes through your mind? You know what? Uh, from an employee, because she's an employee of all of ours, all, everyone on this panel tonight, she's an employee of, and you begin to reveal this and disclose this 18 months after the flag. It's shame on you as an employer. You're not forthcoming. You're not transparent. And it's, it's, it's like Sam said, and this, this might be the only moment we agree tonight. We're not playable. It's not cool. And uh, come better, do better. And then some facts. You are an employee of ours. And as your employee, we want to know more information. And if you're not willing to reveal more information, to your employer, um, do better. Do better as an employee. Appreciate. Well, one it. of the things, one of the things that the spokesperson uh, told Fox too, when we asked those questions that I just addressed about where those sentences came from, uh, who the source is, uh, and why now, is that uh, she basically cites the threats and harassment of Republican, Democratic, and independent state and local election officials in Michigan, and how it needs to stop. That's something that this Secretary of State has talked about for some time. And in fact putting forth a proposal saying we need $100 million in order to run safe elections in Michigan. $100 million. Sam Riddle, too much? Hefty pay, price tag to well, pay? Well, first of all, well, why doesn't this Democratic ticket do something about the abysmally high rate of poverty in Detroit? We need a Marshall Plan. That $100 million could go to alleviate some of the suffering behind the systemic racism and poverty where 60% of Detroit children, mostly Black, wake up every damn day in abject poverty. Do something about that. As a veteran, honorably discharged Vietnam War era veteran, I get more and more disgusted at this Democratic Party and these phony white liberals. They're hypocrites. Do something that real people need right now. Karen, when you when you take a look at uh, that interview with Secretary of State Benson, she uses the word misinformation at least close to a dozen times talking about uh, people's claims that the election may not have been handled properly. I asked her, as you probably just saw, hey, you know what? You have insurrectionists who went to the White House who are insurrectionists. You have people who deny the election. They're deniers. What about doubters? Is there room for people to still doubt in this country? Uh, you know, uh, Ruben, she did mention it, uh, you said, over a dozen times. It was actually almost 27 times that she mis mentioned misinformation, which to me is the sentiment, the Democratic synonym for fake news. Maybe that's, you know, the Democratic um, side. But she talked about, I think you asked her about using uh, a the sec your, your Social Security number for, you know, to make sure that, that there was uh, accuracy there. And she said that that would compromise or potentially compromise uh, security and safety. However, if you go to the website, if you register online, you need your driver's license and your social security number. So maybe she hasn't checked the website. The other thing is that we have a great digital divide here, both not just in urban areas, but also in rural areas. So, you know, is there room for doubters? Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for doubters, especially when what's being said and what is actually happening don't align. Sam Riddle, when you hear the word misinformation coming from the mouths of Democrats, is that their version of fake news? Well, yeah, but you know, I've been a delegate to the Democratic Party National Convention, but I was also a delegate in 1972 to the first National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana. And I recall when Coleman Young and I yelled at each other as Coleman led the Michigan delegation out of that convention in Gary, yelling and screaming, Sam, they're talking about leaving the Democratic Party. I yelled back, it's deleted, but Coleman, the Democratic Party has left us. And there's no clear example about the great class divide, especially in Black America, especially in Black Michigan, especially in Detroit, than how these Democrats are conducting themselves in Michigan. It's a damn shame. Martel, I want to uh, throw things over to you for a moment and talk about what happened in Buffalo here. Uh, at first, of course, there were questions as to, you know, what this guy's intentions were. It became abundantly clear that this was, this was a hate crime. Uh, as someone who's an African-American looking for a leadership position in this state, in this country, what needs to be done to stop that type of hate? Uh, I think that's a deeply rooted question. I mean, like, this is 400 years worth of hate instituted and implemented in America. Uh, and we're not gonna get rid of this hate in my first two years as uh, the next 13th congressional representative. That, 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 that takes time. We gotta address several deeply rooted systemic racism issues in America. This brother, this person 
who did this rampage in Buffalo was out of control, out of pocket. And I wish more people in that grocery store had uh, guns to defend themselves and eliminate this man from Earth. He's but Martel, Martel, first of all, the people, if you watch the video, which unfortunately I did, uh, he walked I in saw it. Yeah, and, and mowed down people without any sense of warning. If someone had a gun, it would be very hard, even for those who are standing there putting their groceries away, to grab for their weapon. But I'll ask you this, though, in terms of condemning, how important is it to hear voices like that of former President Trump using his power and his influence that still is there, and instead of sending out just emails about his campaign and what needs to change about America, but using that platform to condemn this type of violence? Does he have a responsibility to do that? Everyone's responsibility is his or her choice, and how you choose to uh, show that responsibility is up to you. Uh, as the leader of our party right now, uh, I would like for him to uh, condemn that type of behavior. I think every American citizen that's not down with that level of nonsense is condemning uh, that that act, that sense of why, why do you think action. why do you think Martel? Why do you think he won't condemn that? Why won't he use his power, his voice, his microphone to condemn? this terrible mass shooting? You know what, I, I, I'm deeply rooted, I'm, I'm extremely educated, but I have yet to uh, exert the capability to speak to the capability of another person's reason and rationale. I, I don't have that uh, power yet. I think- well, Your guy is a damn racist, Mark. Trump is a racist. Look, Rupe, I've got to inject something here. I still represent the family of Isaiah Shows, the only black student killed during the racist terrorist attack in Columbine. I still represent that family. I work with that family from the time Isaiah's body lay in the Columbine library. No one in this area, very few in the country, have worked in, on as much mass shootings and the causes, especially when racism is his head. I met one-on-one -on -one with President Clinton and the First Lady. I met one-on-one -on -one with Janet Reno. I tried to get Columbine declared a hate crime 23 years ago in 1999. They stonewalled it, in particular, the Democratic Party Attorney General, because these white folks don't want to deal with the inner workings of their DNA when it comes to racism. They, they operate at the height of white privilege right now in Michigan and at the depths of black submission. Both of those are predicated upon white supremacy. Karen, hey, Karen do you, you know what, Sam? How do you come forth from the perspective, from a public relations, from a messaging perspective to get this country into one place of sympathy for something so awful that happened? And what do leaders of both parties have to do right now while that crime scene is still fresh? Well, the thing about it is, though, group, is that it's almost disingenuous to expect one group of people to denounce something that they continue to benefit from. And so, you know, when, when, when you talk about white privilege in this country, yeah, they may be sympathetic and they may march and they'll come and light a candle. But at the end of the day, are they really willing to work to eradicate the structural and institutional um, components that continue to oppress and suppress black and brown people in this this country and the and the answer to that is no. Um, you know, it's not something you can legislate. It's not something you can regulate. You can't protest or pray your way out of it because hate is in a person's heart and it is part of the fabric of this country. And I said the other day that white, you know, supremacy and it's not just somebody in a cloak and in a hood. You know, it's social. It's economic. It's educational. It is in every fabric of the fiber of this country. And so, you know, until one group doesn't benefit from the other group's oppression, <laughs> it's yeah. not going to change. I mean, it's Karen, a one-on-one -on -one commitment for a person. I would, to I would, I would, we're going we're gonna to take a break, though. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have time for final thoughts. So please hold your thoughts there, Sam and Martel. We'll be right back. Okay. Uh, 20 seconds left. Martel with some final thoughts. You know what? The nuances of what's going on in America and in Buffalo, we cannot even begin to deeply dive into and cover. But uh, check me out on Bivings for Congress at 13, Bivings for Congress 13. I am Martel D. Bivings. I was born and reared in Detroit. I am a Detroiter. I know what is needed for the 13th Congressional District and the 118th Congress. I am your guy. I'm going right. to bring the bacon home. Give me a chance and I'll give you a choice. Thank you. Martel, you're running on the Republican ticket. Sam Rill, you're running on the blue ticket, on the Democratic ticket. Your thoughts? 
Absolutely. You know, my name is Sam Riddle. A lot of you know me. A lot of you have hated on me for the wrong reasons. We can only kill this hate, like the artist from Detroit, Bill Harris, says in this painting, if we teach reality-based American history and the evil and the deadly impact of racism in America, and we've got to go in on the poverty that is too prevalent in Detroit right now. Racism Karen, we have about 15 seconds left. All right. We should not just expect more from our elected officials. We should demand more. We should also expect and demand more from each other. Um, I mean, it, it, it's unfortunate that we're continuing to live in an environment that has existed for generations. And at some point, we're going to be willing and capable of facing it for the whole purpose of trying to do and be better. Karen Dumas and our whole panel, thanks for your time. That does it for this edition of Let It Rip.